Okay, good evening and welcome to uh, Calvary Chapel Overside Monday Night Bible Study. It's good to see you all back again. We're continuing our series in the Command of Christ. We started about uh, right around Easter time. Thanks, Frankie. We started right about Easter time and we're going to go for about a year. And uh, our theme verse really comes from the last, the 49th command that Christ gave his disciples. And it's here. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So how do you make disciples? You baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them to observe all that I have commanded you, Jesus says, and with you always, even to the end of the age. And so again, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is, is when Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And so when we started this study, we learned that if you don't know what Christ's commands are, if you don't understand them to the point where you can apply them, well, then you really can't love Christ the way that he wants to be loved. And so tonight we're going to be looking at the command, the tenth command, love your enemies. And the corresponding character quality of love your enemies is uh, creativity. And so six times actually in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said things, uh, he said these specific things. He says, you have heard that it was said. And so you know that the people of the time, either they, they couldn't read or they didn't have the Bible in their own language. So they were always had to listen to what their religious teachers, what the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees taught them. And so a lot of the things that they were taught were incorrect. And a lot of the things they were taught actually passed down from generation to generation to generation for almost 400 years, what they called the Dark Ages, from the time of Malachi until the time of John the Baptist, until we had the Bible again written. So there was a lot of tradition that was throughout the generations. And some of that even spills into our culture today. And you'll see how this one actually spills into our culture today. And so out of these six things, we didn't talk about divorce because that really wasn't a command. Jesus says, you've heard what it said, you should not... Uh, you, you should uh, divorce a person for any reason. And Jesus said, no, it's not for any reason. It's for a specific reason. But the ones that we've talked about so far were anger, lust, lying, revenge, and hatred. And of course, we know that murder is wrong to, to murder someone, and they believe that also, and we believe that. But Jesus says, I want, to, I want to back that up a little bit. I want to back that up to really what the intent of that law was, and that's that you shouldn't be angry with somebody to the point where you actually start to name call them. And that's really where you draw the line. So if you're angry at somebody who's on the freeway, your spouse, your children, or anybody, and it's almost common practice today that people will just, as soon as something happens to you, just blurt out some kind of name. Somebody drives in front of you, and the first thing in your head is, you idiot. All these things just immediately come out of your head. And Jesus says, if you actually say that to somebody, then you've sinned. You've crossed the line. You're starting to murder them in your heart. And of course, that goes into further when you not only uh, insult their intellect, but you also in insult their character and tell them like they're a fool, basically passing judgment on them that they are a godless person, that they're good for nothing. They're not only intellectually stupid, but they're godless. And so the next thing you, should, you do is you actually you would murder them. And with lust, Jesus says, you've heard it, it said you're not supposed to commit adultery, and everybody would agree that that's wrong. But Jesus says, no, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you have already committed adultery with her already. And then in the area of lying, we know that we're not supposed to take a false oath or cross your fingers or engage in any type of oath. And they taught that if the oath that you took invoked God's name and you said, I swear to God, I will not do this, then you had to keep to that oath. But if you did anything else and you didn't use God's name, you could actually lie and get away with it and it was okay. But Jesus taught us that any form of lying is wrong. He said, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then we also talked about an eye for an eye, which we talked about last week, is personal vengeance. And you know that we have rights in this country. We feel we have personal rights. And if somebody violates our rights, we feel like we have a right to get instantly revenge on that person. And today we're going to talk about hatred, how we think we might have a right to hate certain people in our culture. And we'll talk about who those people are. And Jesus backs us up from that, and he goes, I want you to understand that that has never been what I have taught. And he corrects us on that teaching. So anger, lust, lying, revenge, and hate, and self-centeredness is really a part of our sinful nature, the nature that we have in us today. And these things, we cannot stop doing these things on our own strength. And so that's why Jesus told the Pharisees, unless I, he says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness, yours and mine, exceeds or surpasses that of the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And see, the Sadducees and Pharisees, they change God's word. They changed it to different traditions and rules so that they could follow them within their human strength. And perhaps that's why you hear this in the children's ministry, they were sad, you see, the Sadducees. 
And so what they really tried to promote was self-righteousness. They changed the rules, and we do the same thing. We change the rules so that we can meet those rules when it comes to anger, lust. We put in our mind, you know, I can be this angry, but not this angry. And Jesus is saying, no, anger that leads to name-calling is sin. Lusting a woman is sin. Lying is sin. Seeking revenge is sin. Hatred is sin. And what the Pharisees could not do and what you and I cannot do is we cannot live a life like this. It's impossible to live a life like this, and that's what Jesus' point is. The, the, the Sadducees had self-righteousness, and we sometimes have self-righteousness. And what Jesus is trying to tell us, unless we are born again, unless we are born anew, unless Christ lives inside of us, these things will be who we are. We cannot escape these things. The only way that we can live a life like this is if Christ lives inside of us. And so, last week we talked about per personal vengeance. And you said people, uh, it says, you heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. And if someone forces you to go one mile, we'll go with him too. And see, the traditions taught them at the time that you had a right to retaliate if somebody offends you. And Today we even had that. First thing somebody does something, you not only think you're going to sue them, but you feel like you have some right to retaliate against them. But Jesus is telling us last week, he says, you don't have a right to retaliate. You've never had a right to retaliate. That is something that God has never given us as his creation. He says that vengeance and wrath and all punishment has always been God's responsibility. And it still is God's responsibility, but not ours. We never need to take the law into our own hand. Either the law will take care of it, and if the law doesn't take care of it, then God himself will personally take care of it. You and I never have to worry about that. He says in Psalms, or and Paul says in Romans, he says, do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And see, the Lord promises that he is the one that's going to protect us. He's the one that's going to avenge us. We never have to do it ourselves. He is powerful enough to do that without our help, without our help, and we should never do it ourselves. Matter of fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus there praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's a very interesting thing happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. You may remember, you may remember the story, but never really thought about it too much. We never see Jesus using his power to harm or hurt anyone. He had tremendous power to raise the dead, to walk on water, to defile all forms of physics and laws because he is God. He created all those things. But there's this one point in the garden. I want you to see what it says. And it says this. It says, when they came to arrest Jesus, you may remember, they had the uh, their upper room. They went out to cross over the Kidron Valley. They went up into the Garden of Gethsemane there, and Jesus was praying. And then they came out to arrest Jesus. And this is what happened. When they came to arrest Jesus, in John 18, it says this. When Jesus said... They were looking for Jesus, and Jesus said, I am he. And as soon as he said this, it says they drew back and they fell on the ground. You guys remember that happened? All the soldiers and all the religious leaders and Judas, Jesus stood up and they said, we're looking for Jesus. And Jesus basically stood up, and I can picture him getting in front of his people and saying, I am he. And as soon as that happened, they all fell to the ground. And see, then what he said, he said to him again, he goes, now who is it that you want? So first of all, he got their attention that he is all-powerful. He could have took their lives right there. But what he did is he stopped them from getting to his disciples. And he said, who is it that you want? And they said to him, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, well, then he goes, I am he, he answered. And he goes, if you're looking for me, then only take me and leave these alone. And again, they only arrested Jesus. So we see right there that Jesus has the power to protect you and I from any type of vengeance, from anything that may happen in our lives. And he can choose to exercise that or not exercise that. We never need to retaliate with any type of personal vengeance ourselves. And so I hope you are obeying that command. And when people do offend you, which they will, whether it's on the freeway, whether it's your spouse, whether your children, whether your friends, your family, your coworkers, whoever it is, and all of a sudden in your mind you have that instant revenge that you want, then you would repent of that and ask God to forgive you and give you his strength. And then today you'll see what we need to do with it afterwards. I'm going to show you a little clip of a referee. And this referee is a perfect example of someone who, he's being belittled, he's being yelled at, but he just refuses to seek any type of personal revenge back. He doesn't even answer back. And it's, it's kind of a wonder where he gets that type of training to endure what he's been enduring in this, in this clip. So if our TV folks can actually uh, play this clip of this referee. A very close call. Could have gone either way. It was right on the line. Now, first
Ferguson's not too happy with it, I can tell you that much. Oh, he's beating him like a rented mule. <laughs> and the ref's just tuning him out. Boy, where do you train to take a beating like that? Is that when that part's gonna get saved? And that little talk! It's been three weeks! Three weeks! Hard for you to say that you love me once in a while! So whether it was the, uh, the people or... I know I'll get in trouble for that later. But either way, perfect example of not taking out any type of revenge, regardless of the circumstances. And so tonight what we're going to look at is this command where the Lord tells us to love your enemies. We'll see who those enemies are and, and what he actually means there. And before we do, let's pray. And so Lord, we just thank you again for this time that we have your Bible. Lord, we thank you for this place that we can come and we can learn from you. And Lord, my desire, and I know our desire, because we're here, is to hear what Jesus had to say to his first disciples on the Sermon of the Mount. And Lord, as we hear this command that you teach us tonight, Father, I pray that you would just clear our minds so that we truly can focus, that we truly can hear what you have to say. And Lord, maybe your words will just erase all the things that we've been taught, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees taught, and the things that maybe we even learned from our culture on what to do with our enemies. And maybe we have your mind. Maybe we think your thoughts, see what you see, and feel what you feel, and today hopefully love as you love the people that we would call our enemies. And so, Lord, when we do, I pray you will also, by your Spirit, help us to remember this week and through the rest of our lives how we should treat our enemies, that we should love them, and what that means. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so this is the command. It's, it's, it's the sixth of the commands that Jesus talked, or the fifth of the command that Jesus talked about. You've heard that it was said, but I tell you. So I'm going to read it in its context in Matthew 5:43. It says, if you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and you should hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, and bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And so Jesus is saying, again, you have heard that it was said that you shall love your neighbor. Now, I want to show you something because in this command here, the Pharisees are doing something with grammar, word definitions, sentence structures, translations, and every form of written and verbal communication was designed to communicate a truth. But what they're doing here and what, and what you see in our culture today is that people can use grammar, word definitions, sentence structures, translations and even every form of verbal and written communication to conceal lies and then even to completely change the meaning of the truth. And so I'm going to give you a kind of a, a strange example here and hopefully it'll make sense to you when we get to the, uh, when I talk to you about what the Pharisees and the Sadducees were doing. And so here's a simple question that you could ask somebody. Did you take the math test yesterday? Simple question you would ask somebody. And a simple answer would normally be yes or no. But this is how people, how you can change the meaning of any one sentence just by what you emphasize in that sentence. So the answer is, I didn't take the test yesterday. Now, depending on what word you emphasize in that sentence, it can mean something completely different. And you'll see this happens in Congress. This is what filibusters do. This is what they do in courts. This is how things get drawn on for hours and days and months and years in courts of law because they get tied up into this. And I'll see how it affects uh, what the people were taught of that day. So the first thing is, is I didn't take the yes test today. I didn't take it. So the first, if you emphasize I, you're saying that there was a test yesterday and others took it, but I didn't. And if you emphasize didn't, you say, well, you thought that I took the yes test yesterday, but I didn't take it. And if you emphasize take, you said I didn't take the test yesterday. I just reviewed the test, but we didn't actually take it. If you em emphasize the, you can say, I took a test, but it wasn't the test that you're thinking of. It wasn't the math test that you're thinking of. And if you say, emphasize the test, you can say, well, it wasn't a test. There was a quiz. And if you emphasize yesterday, are you saying, I didn't take the test. I took it, but I didn't take it yesterday. And so you say, well, that's crazy. People don't do that. People don't emphasize those different words. So let, let me give you an actual uh, question that was asked to a former president during an investigation. Again, 
you may not know who the president is, and again, my intent is not to slander people. So I just leave the names out to protect the uh, guilty or the innocent, however that may be. This was the question that was, question that was specifically asked. I said, Mr. President, you had an inappropriate relationship with Mrs. Smith. Is that correct? And this is the exact thing that he said. And you say, well, people don't talk like this. He should have said yes or no. And this is what he said. Well, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. <laughs> you should listen to the tape or even watch the video when he's asked that question. You had an inappropriate relation, Mrs. Is that correct? He said, well, it depends on what the definition of the word is, is. And then he said this. If is is referring to when I was asked the question, then the answer is no. If is is referring to before I was asked the question, then that is correct. And it's like, well, did you or didn't you just say yes or no? But see, when you get in that type of detail, you never get anywhere. You just go around and around, and every word and every sentence, you can try to define the definition. And the whole intent of that is not to communicate the truth. Because a truthful person would just simply say yes or no. And that's why Jesus told us just to let your yes be yes and your no be no. So today you're going to see where Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your enemy. But see, that's not even correct. Only part of what they heard, part of the verse is missing from Leviticus. The Bible never says, like they told you one time before when we did the introduction, it never says that you should just love your enemy or love your neighbor. It says you should love your neighbor as yourself. And again, there's a big difference between loving your neighbor and loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as you would treat yourself. A simple analogy is, I use is when you have food on the table. The Pharisees would kindly just throw some food onto the floor for the dogs or for the Gentiles. And as far as they were concerned, that was loving their neighbor. But that's not how they would love themselves. Jesus said, no, love yourself. Your neighbor as yourself, what you would do is you would divide your meal. You would split up your meal. You would share what you have, not just the crumbs of what you had. And so the verse actually comes from Leviticus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Romans, Galatians, and James. It's all over the Bible. And it says this. It first starts in Leviticus 19.18 is the first time we see this. And Jesus says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people. But love your neighbor as yourself, because I am the Lord. And see, loving your neighbor as yourself has always been part of God's plan. It's never been anything different. The Lord actually said to Cain back in the garden in, in Genesis 4, 9, he says, the Lord said to Cain, he says, where is your brother Abel? He said, I don't know where my brother is. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? And so we are our brother's keeper. And that's what Jesus was saying. Where is your brother? He said, I'm not, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are your brother's keeper. That was his whole point. The parable of the Good Samaritan, I'm sure you are aware of, tells us that anybody that we come across in our daily life that's in need, that's who our neighbor is. That's the definition of our neighbor, not just the one who lives on our left and right. Anyone we come across, you guys are my neighbors right now. I'm your neighbor right now. And God has always commanded his people to love their neighbors as themselves. Matter of fact, in Deuteronomy 22, speaking of a friend, someone that would, they would friend, it says, if your brother's ox or his sheep is straying, he goes, do not ignore it. But take it back with you. If the brother does not, uh, if the brother does not uh, live near you or he doesn't, you don't know who it is, just bring it to your house and keep it with you until he comes looking for it. And the command to love your neighbor as yourself didn't always have to do with people that were your friends. It also had to, always had to do with your enemies. And the enemy here that we're talking about here is not someone that was, is trying to kill you or it's someone that you would meet in a battle or, or in a war. That's not the enemy Jesus is talking about. The enemy that Jesus is talking about and we're going to look at the three specific enemies we have. But the enemy that Jesus is talking about is somebody that's antagonistic towards you. You may have some people in your life like this. They're hostile toward you. They're maybe unfriendly. For some reason, you're just incompatible. You're, uh, they're aggressive to you. They're unkind. Or for, for some reason or another, they just don't like you and you just don't like them. These people are considered your enemies and they're all over the place. Matter of fact, this is what Job said. And we'll see next week when we look at the command, be perfect. God says that Job was a perfect man, and this is one thing that Job would say. I don't know if you've ever seen Job, but this is Job. So, you know, on Wednesday night, we get to see all the people from the past here. But this is Job, and this is what Job said. Job says, have I ever rejoiced when, when disaster struck my enemies? No. Have I ever become excited when harm came to my enemies? No. Have I ever sinned by even cursing my enemies or asking God to take revenge on my enemies? No. 
See, Job did nothing. He thought nothing. He said nothing against his enemies. Matter of fact, when his enemies were in need, he helped his enemies. Job further says this. He says, my servants will never say to you, he lets other people go hungry because I don't. They will never say he has turned away a stranger that was in need because I've never turned away a stranger or anyone who was considered my enemy at my door. And King David also, this is how King David treated his enemies. This is the, uh, in Getty, you can see there, pretty much in the center there where it looks like a, a valley. It's a little, a draw there. This is a, another picture. This is where King David uh, escaped from Saul too. He went, and I don't know if you can see those little people there in the lower middle of your screen to show you the size of that. Well, David and his 300 men escaped into the caves there because King Saul was after him. He was, he was going to kill him. And this is actually one of the caves that's in that area. And so let me tell you what, how uh, David treated his enemies. First of all, David says, my enemies, they, my enemies repay, repay me evil for good. Matter of fact, I'm sick with despair about that. But when they are ill, I grieve for them. I even deny myself in fasting for them. And I was sad as though they were my friends or my family. I even prayed for them and grieved for them as if they were my own mothers. And he's speaking of his, his father. And see, David has the heart of Jesus, and we're going to see why uh, by the time we get to the end. And this is what, how the story goes in uh, 1 Samuel 24 on how David treated his enemy, King Saul. See, David was first hiding in this cave, and King Saul came looking for him with about 3,000 men. Now, King Saul actually went in the same cave that David was in because he had to relieve himself. I'm sure he knows what that means. And King David's men actually whispered to him, and they said, look, that's Saul. You, now you have the opportunity, David. And so what David did is he snuck up and he cut a piece of his robe off of him. Now, David's conscience even st immediately started working on him. It says, it says, he says, the Lord knows that I shouldn't have done that. He's already felt bad on what he did. But, and David restrained the rest of his men from outright killing Saul there in a cave. And so after Saul left the cave and he was going on his way, David ran out of the cave and he shouted to King Saul who was leaving and he said, my Lord and my King. Is that how we speak to our enemies? No. When Saul turned around and he saw that it was David, David actually bowed down towards the ground. Not in worship, but out of respect. And he said, Saul, why do you listen to the people who say I'm trying to harm you? I cut off a piece of your robe and here it is. I could have killed you, but I didn't kill you. And David said, there's an old proverb that says, evil people do evil things. So you should never be concerned that I will ever harm you. I will never harm you. And see, David had every reason to hate Saul or even to kill Saul. But David refused to return evil for evil. And he would not hate his enemy. And so let's look and see how the rabbinical law and how the Sadducees and the Pharisees were actually changing what Jesus is saying. And the first thing they said is, you heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and you shall hate your enemy. See, the tradition actually says this, you shall love only those that love you. You should only love those that are within your little clan, within your little group. And you are allowed to hate everybody else. It's acceptable. You're allowed to do that. And see, the words that you shall love, they sound good. You should love your neighbor. That sounds good. And the words, you should hate your enemy, well, that sounds reasonable, that you should hate your enemy. But the problem is, that's never what the Bible says. But that's what they were teaching. And see, a little truth always makes a lie seem more believable. And we'll look in a second here how the cults do that. So what the religious leaders, they incorrectly taught the Old Testament by two and two things. They left out things on purpose, and they added things on purpose. And by doing that, they changed the entire meaning of what had happened. And there's a warning in the book of Revelations about doing this. And this is what the warning says. John says this, he goes, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, well, God will take away from his part from the book of life and from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. That's the book of life. You can see my name's written in there. <laughs> praise, praise the Lord for that. And so let me show you how this happens. Uh, because somebody asked me this question, and, and you see this all the time. So let me try to give you some examples here so you understand how this is done correctly and how it's done incorrectly. 
The very next verse there, because I just read to you Revelations 22, 18 and 19 from uh, the New Living Translation. This is the very next verse, Revelations 22, 20, and it says this. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's what the scripture says. But if I say to you something like, Jesus said, surely I am coming quickly, even though I didn't use all the words that are in that verse, I did not change the meaning of that verse. As a matter of fact, the Bible was never given to us in chapter and verse. We just add chapter and verse. And so somebody asked me one time is, why do you only quote part of a verse or why do you only quote part of a chapter like I just did in Samuel? Because we'd be here all night if I quoted the whole chapter. I might as well quote the whole book and read the whole Bible. So when I say Jesus said, surely I am coming quickly, that is correct. But if I said, Jesus said, surely I am not coming quickly. Can you see how that immediately changes the whole meaning of the scripture? And so, let me carry this out just a little bit more. This is John 1.1, 1, 1, so you can see how this actually happens. And I want, I'm showing you this so that you can see that it's deliberate. It's not that somebody makes a mistake, pastors make a mistake, you make a mistake, sometimes we have a misunderstanding of, of a scripture. I've certainly done that many times in my life and relearned it and heard it a different way, or God taught me that it was incorrect. But this is done deliberately for a deliberate reason. And so this is John 1.1, 1, 1, and actually the Koine Greek, which is the original language that it was written in, John 1.1. 1, 1. And this is what's called a Greek transliteration. This is a, just a different way of writing the same Greek context. And then what we do when people translate that, this is almost a word-for-word -word translation, a little bit different. And what this word-for-word -word translation says is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was the Word. But if you see in your Bibles, if you go to John 1, 1, you'll probably see it written like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And see, if you say that God was with the Word, or God was the Word, and the Word was God, you're, you're not changing the meaning of what it says. But this is what the Jehovah Witness Bible does to that verse. And I wish I had a little pointer here, but if I can show you the Theos en ho Logos means God was the Word. It's, that's exactly how it's written. You can't change it. There's no A in there, as you'll see what the Jehovah Witness does. This is how their Bible reads. It says, and their Bible is the, uh, the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. And this is what it says. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Simply adding the word A, a little letter A, changes the whole meaning of that verse. And so... If your Bible says the Word was God or God was the Word, that's not incorrect, that's correct. But if your Bible says it was a God, what you're saying is, what this verse is actually saying, that Jesus was in the beginning with God, Jesus is God, Jesus is God. And this was saying, no, Jesus is a God. He's just one of many gods. And that's what you'll see in the Jehovah Witness Bible. So when you see that, that's completely wrong. And that's how you can completely uh, skew the scriptures to saying something that it doesn't say at all. And so these clever deceptions that you see, they're everywhere. And this is why Timothy tells us, or Paul tells Timothy, that he needs to study the scriptures. This is why God gives us pastors and teachers to help us understand these things. And more importantly, this is why God gives us his Holy Spirit. And so briefly on studying the pastors and the Holy Spirit, in 2 Timothy 2.15 it says, you need to study not just read, study to show yourself approved unto God. You'll be a workman who does not need to be ashamed. You can rightly divide the word of truth. And regarding pastors and teachers, Paul tells us in Ephesians, says, now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. He gave them the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. Why? Their responsibility is, is to equip God's people. How? So that they would be mature in the Lord. And they would no longer be immature like children. So that we will not be tossed and blown away or blown by every wind of new teaching. That we will not be influenced by the people that try to trick us with lies so clever that they even sound like the truth. And so we need to read and we need to study the Bible. And we need to have pastors and teachers that you trust. And you need to ultimately rely on the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth. John said this, he says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor. And he will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads you into whole truth. And so ultimately, when I study, I'll read commentaries, and I'll read the different languages of those I can and try to understand on the best I can. But ultimately, I just ask the Holy Spirit to help me understand what this scripture means. And the Bible tells us that he will 
his spirit will bear witness with your, spirit, with, uh, with your spirit that what you're hearing is truth or it's not a truth. And if somebody said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God, immediately I hear something. It's like something doesn't sound right. Now if you read that, something doesn't sound right. And so if you, so one time, if you ever get a hold of, uh, of a different Bible or the Koran or uh, of the Jehovah Witness Bible, as you start reading it, all of a sudden your spirit just seems like something's weird. It's like it doesn't seem like this is saying what's true. And so, because it's not true. And so what the religious leaders were doing at this time, and they were doing this exact same thing, what I'm telling you, they were doing it on purpose. It wasn't accidental what they were doing. They were perverting God's law and God's scripture by specifically leaving out words. And this is what they said. The phrase, as yourself, was omitted from love your neighbor. They specifically took that out. Why did they take it out? Because the religious leaders could not imagine. I don't know the name of that movie that Pastor Mike likes, but where the guy says it's inconceivable. Right? It's conceivable that the, that the Pharisees and the Sadducees would love somebody as much as they loved themselves. That was absolutely inconceivable. So what they did is they just took it out. They simply took it out. Now, remember the scribes were extreme, extremely gifted and skilled in translating the scriptures. And so they left it out on purpose. It wasn't by accident. That whole phrase, as yourself, was just completely let out. And you know that the religious leaders, they love to be honored. They love to be praised. They love to be respected. Matthew 6 talks a lot about that. And they believe that they deserved all this honor, all this respect and praise. And they even thank God, from, as you'll see in Luke 18, 11, that they were not like other people. They were not like you and I. They were special. And so they simply did not want to love other people the way that they loved themselves. So they just left that phrase out. And worse, they even taught the Jews that a neighbor only included the people that you like. So if I liked this group of people, then they would be considered my neighbor. But if they weren't part of my group, then they would be considered my enemy. And I didn't have to like them. And that was, that was acceptable. This is why Nicodemus was so shocked when Jesus told him this. He said, Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And Nicodemus was thinking, what? God loves the world? I thought he just loved the Jews. I thought he just loved us, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, like above all, and then the Jews. He goes, no, God loves the world, not just the Jews. And sometimes I wonder today what, what the world would be like if we actually lived by this verse and were taught this verse. Love your neighbor as yourself. In the picture here, you can see a great juxtaposition of rich and the poor and I'm not saying we become a communist country or a socialist country, but if people truly did love their neighbors as themselves, what the world would be like today. And see, the religious leaders, they hated Jesus because Jesus associated with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes and the poor and the sick. And most likely, if Jesus was in this picture, you know where he would be for those that were in need. And so they also perverted God's law by adding things to God's law. Now, was he that? He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and you shall hate your enemy. And see, the Lord has never taught us in scripture anywhere to hate your enemy. It's not there. What this false teaching had did to the Jews is it taught the Jews to hate other people that were not Jews. Matter of fact, a saying one of the Pharisees had goes like this. It says, if a Jew sees a Gentile that's falling into the sea, let him by no means lift him out. For it is written, you shall not rise against the blood of your neighbor, which means you should not kill your neighbor, but this man is not your neighbor. So they taught the Jews that the Gentiles were not their neighbors. And so not only did they not have to love them, they could hate them, and that was acceptable. And this is why when, the Romes, when Rome came into Jerusalem and, and saw the Jews, they referred to the Jews as the haters of the human race because of the way that they treated other people that were not Jews. And Jesus says many times to the teachers of the law, he said, woe to you teachers of the law and you Sadducees and Pharisees, because woe means that Jesus had anguish. He had grief. He had distress and sadness that they were teaching this to people, that they should only love themselves and they can hate anybody except themselves. And it grieves God that some of people today do that, especially when Christians do it to other Christians. And so this is what 
John in the book of Revelations thinks about those that are perishing and those that are considered his enemies. In Revelation 10, he explains how he feels about this. He doesn't rejoice in knowing that the enemy or that those without Christ will suffer eternal damnation. This is what he says. He says, And the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. It said, Go and take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. And so I went to the angel and I asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, Take it and eat it, and it will turn sour in your stomach, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. So I took the little scroll the angels gave me and I ate it, and it tasted sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I eaten it, it turned sour in my stomach. And then I was told, you must prophesy against the people, the nations, the languages, and the kings. And see, the victory of the Lord over sin, eventually it was very sweet into his mouth. But when John realized that there's going to be millions and millions of people that are going to suffer into the lake of fire for rejecting Christ, that turned sour and bitter in his stomach. And that should also sadden us, as it said to John. Our attitude towards, towards everyone should always be to love all people and hope that all people will one day turn to the Lord. Now, love doesn't mean that we tolerate sin because we see that God loved Adam, but he cursed him. We see that God loved Cain, but he punished him. God loved Solomon and Gomorrah, but he destroyed him. And God loves Israel, but he allowed them to be conquered and exiled. But he says, I say to you, love your enemy. Instead of hating your enemy, which is never in the, in the scripture, he completely changes it around. He says, I say, love your enemy. Now, when the religious leaders heard this, they were completely shocked. That was completely new to them. And even today, when we're, we tell somebody to love your enemy, unless you understand what it means, it kind of shocks us. It's like, what does that mean exactly? How do I do that? Should I love my enemy? And so there's four words that we have for love, and you might know of the four words. One of them is phileo, which is brotherly love or uh, like a friendship type of love. The other one is storge, which is a love within your family, Greek words. Uh, eros is a, like a desiring type of romantic love. And then agape is the unconditional love. It's, uh, it seeks the good of others, basically. And it also involves action, as you see in 1 Corinthians 13. There's 15 words there that describe love and how you do love, and they're all action words. They're all action, they're all verbs. And see, agape is the love that God is talking about here. It's also the love that God demonstrates for us, and it's the love that he also gives us. The Bible tells us the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. He says that God demonstrates his love towards us and that where we get sinners, Christ died for us. And because he loved us, we can love. And if we love one another, Christ abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And he says, a commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you. And so we hear a lot about love, so I want to show you a little a video of a person who just throws out the word love and just kind of goes over the, some of the things that we've heard and just tries to narrow down really what it means to love. So if our TV guys, gals. Love. There it is, that word. It's a very popular word, isn't it? So many meanings, so many feelings attached to it, so many definitions, so many experiences. We think we know what it means, but honestly, it's, it's been distorted, misrepresented, misunderstood, misused so much that perhaps we've lost sight of its real meaning. Poets, philosophers, songwriters, filmmakers, painters, dancers, businessmen, scientists, congressmen, everybody's tried to express its meaning. Some get close, others are way off. Some refuse to accept where it comes from, still others act like they don't need it, while others try to convince us that it's just a basic function of the brain. John Lennon said it's all we need. Pat Benatar said it's a battlefield. Sinatra, for all you old people out there, said it's a mini splintered thing, whatever that means. To be honest, we've all thrown the word around in some glib reference to ice cream or a football team as if the word is interchangeable between products and people. And I'm not trying to knock that. It's just that sometimes I really want to know what a word means. It kind of helps in conversations and human communication. But this word, huh? Can we really define it? Is it too ambiguous, too morphed from its original meaning, too mysterious we can't even expect anything from it? Well, maybe, maybe the creator of its original meaning should be consulted. So let's glean from his book and see how he defines it, shall we? Agape. That's the New Testament word for love that I'm talking about, the kind of love that we're all really longing for and nothing else even comes close. This is the kind of love when demonstrated properly changes everything. It's an act of an unconditional love. It's the kind of love that says, I'll never think of myself first. Everything I do is for someone else. It's a kind of love that says, I'll be rejected so you can be accepted. 
I'll be humiliated so you can be lifted up. It's the kind of love that says, I'll sit this one out for the good of the team. I'll move to the back so my friend can move up front. It's a rare love that proves its merit by action. The kind that wakes up every morning and asks, how can I outserve everyone around me today? The kind of love that when there's only three tickets to a U2 concert and four people want to go, your friend says he'll catch them the next time you're in town. It's a motivational love that says, don't worry because I got your back. You can do all things with me on your side. It's the kind of love that says, I'm with you always. I'll provide for you. I'll sit with you beside still waters and I'll go before you in battle. It whispers, I forgive you, and it shouts, I'm your best friend. It leads you to truth. It steers you from harm. It's the kind of love that can't be earned, that can't be bought, that won't leave you, that won't forsake you, and that won't misjudge you. It's a rare kind of love that will tackle you to the ground so you won't fall off a cliff. This is the kind of love that's better than life. It's stronger than death. It's patient. It's kind. It always protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. Agape love is unmerited. It's unmovable. It's unshakable. It's undeniable, indestructible, secure, sensitive, and straightforward. It's the kind of love that builds up, it seeks the lost, it befriends enemies, it corrects, it guides, it comforts, it reassures. In the simplest of terms and maybe most complete definition, it's the kind of love that says, I'll die so you can live. And so before we look at the application really of how do we love our enemy, how the Lord specifically tells us to love our enemy, that's one thing I love about the Bible. It doesn't only tell us what we need to do, it specifically tells us how. It doesn't leave it to us to try to figure it out. And so let's look at who our enemies are. First of all, we have th three, three basic enemies. We have uh, personal enemies, political enemies, and religious enemies. And so the first one is personal, personal enemies. Again, these, these aren't people that are trying to kill you. These aren't people in a war time. These are people that curse you. They seem to hate you. They persecute you. For some reason, they just don't like you. And I don't know if you have anybody like that in your life. My neighbor, uh, I've lived here for 10 years, and my neighbor, for some reason, just doesn't like me. Am I not a likable person or something? <laughs> he just doesn't like me. And I call him my spiritual sandpaper because <laughs> he's called the cops on me several times. One time, uh, there was uh, some bird droppings swept in front of his street, and he called the cops, and they, he told them that I did that. It was some type of ritual, like I was putting a hex on him or something. <laughs> and so the cops looked at me cross-eyed. Another time, uh, a cat got in my garbage and brought some chicken bones or something and brought them over in his yard, so he called the cops on me. And he said that I did it. it like I went to my garbage, and I dug up these chicken bones, and and threw him in his yard. And I've never done anything to this guy. I've always tried to help him. Uh, but he's just different. So uh, he could be considered one of my personal enemies. That I didn't offend him. Not that I know of. I've tried to talk to him. I've tried to help him. And I still will talk to uh, his family, his mom and dad. They're very kind. I talk to them. They, they tell me that he's crazy. But I seem to get along with his mom and dad. His wife will wave to me from time to time. But the bottom line is, in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us that when we're cursed, that we need to bless. And when we're persecuted, we just need to endure it. I don't need to call the cops back on him or deliberately do something so that he has a reason to call the cops. See, that's what we want to do. It's like, if you call the cops on me, fine. Next time, I'll give you a reason to call the cops on me. But I haven't, and I'm not going to. And when we're slandered, we just answer kindly. Now, we have political enemies also, some of our political enemies in the time that this was written. Rome was certainly their political enemy. The Romans hated the Jews, you know that. Their government was against the people. And today, not necessarily our government is against us as people, but there's a lot of laws in our government that are against the Christian faith. A lot of the marriage things, a lot of the abortion laws, a lot of the treatment of Israel, they're against what we believe and what we think God expects us to do. If we lived during the time of Hitler, if he was uh, in charge of us and we were German in that time frame, that certainly would be considered a political enemy. And even Saddam uh, certainly was a political enemy, killing his own people there in Iraq. And see, Proverbs 29, 2 says this. It says, when the godly people are in authority, the people are happy. But when the wicked are in power, the people become miserable. It says... It also tells us that ultimately the people that are in power are the people that God puts in power. And we need to remember that. That God is sovereign. God is the Alpha and the Omega. And he has everything planned out from the beginning to the end. 
And he puts certain people in power to ensure that his plans will progress. It says in Psalm 75, it says, It is God alone who judges. He decides who will rise and who will fall. There's no one that's ever been in power throughout history that God had not allowed to be in power. And this is what Timothy says about that. He says in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, he says, I urge you then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, especially for kings, we would say presidents, or those that are in authority. Why? So that we can live peaceful and quiet lights, quiet lives, in all godliness and holiness. We're supposed to pray for those that are in authority. Now I'm going to show you here a picture of the, of the president and his family. Whether you voted for the president or like the president is really irrelevant because God's word tells us that we should pray for the president. And some of you may not like his standards. You might not like the things that he does. And he might even be considered an enemy to you in some respect. But the way that God tells us in this verse and what we should consider is the things that we should pray for is his family, his marriage. Would we want his marriage to fail? Certainly not. Would we want his kids <clears throat> to be harmed in any way? You know the presidential job is the, one, is the most uh, deadly or I uh, can't think of the word, but it's the, uh, people want to kill the president. They want to kill the president's wife. They want to kill the president's children. There's more people in the world against our president, and they would, they would like to see that family killed. Would we want to see the family killed? Absolutely not. So we need to pray. We need to pray for his family. We need to pray for his marriage. We need to pray for his health, regardless if you like his policies or you don't like his policies. And that's what the Lord would ask us to do. What if President Ob Barack Obama became a Christian? How would that affect the world today? What if one day all of us decided to pray and all Christians decided to pray for the president? And one day, the Lord spoke to him, and he became a believer. <clears throat> and he comes out and says, God spoke to me. God touched my heart, and we need to change things in America. We need to change the way we look at marriage, and the way we look at abortion, <clears throat> and the way we look at Israel, and all these other things. It would drastically change America. But see, that will, that's not going to happen if we just are constantly opposed to our president. We constantly can treat him as if he is an enemy. And I hear that a lot, even in churches and even in the military how much people despise him. But the Lord would never tell us to despise the man, but to pray for him. So I hope that you do pray for him. How about people that we consider false teachers? Do you know false teachers actually have a false God? And a false God cannot hear their prayers, and a false God doesn't answer their prayers. Now this picture here is not that these are false teachers, but these are the top ten people that are in controversy right now within the United States. Some may be false, some may not be false. But again, that's irrelevant. We're not supposed to be looking at that. Next week we'll look at, or not next week, uh, later on we'll look at uh, <clears throat> Christ commands beware of false teachers and he'll help us identify what a false teacher is. But we need to be careful that we don't join in these discussions and be bad-mouthing and slandering these people. Because the bottom line is if they don't know Jesus Christ, they're lost. They're in the dark and they're on the way to hell. And maybe if you lead in other people to hell. And so, the Bible also tells us that in Isaiah 48, 22, it says, There is no peace, says the Lord, to the wicked. And so if these people don't know the Lord, even though they may have smiles and they may appear happy, and every, anybody else in your life that is not a believer and don't know Christ, they may be smiling, they may be happy, but Isaiah says in their heart there is no peace. If they don't know the Lord, there's sorrow in their heart. And Jesus, again, will teach us about uh, beware of false teachers. So let me give you a couple examples on how we're to love our enemy and then show you an application how we, we, we could do that. The first one is found in 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, 2 Kings chapter 6, interesting, Syria. Syria is in the news today again. Uh, Syria was at war with Israel. Now the king of Syria sent many soldiers to capture the prophet Elisha. And when these soldiers got close, Elijah asked God to temporarily blind these soldiers, and God did. God blinded all those soldiers. And then Elijah brought these blind soldiers to the king of Israel, and the king wanted to kill them. But Elijah told the king that instead of killing them, what he should do is give them a banquet. So the king gave them a banquet, and he fed them, and then he sent them home. 
And then the conclusion of that is recorded in 2 Kings 6.23. It says this, And so the bands of the Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. And so Elijah was wise in treating his enemies with kindness and feeding them. They were hungry and sending them on their way. And from that point, they never came and they attacked Israel again. Here's another example from King Philip II of Spain. This man hated Christians for one reason or another. And it says that his rule was a rule of terror because he slaughtered thousands of Christians. It's reported that one man was sentenced to death for being a Christian under this guy, but he happened to escape from the, their camp during the dead of winter. And one of the soldiers went after him to pursue him. Now the Christian came to a lake that was thinly frozen, and he managed to get across the lake without breaking through. And as he started running again, he heard the scream of the soldier who had fallen in the lake behind him. And so at the risk of drowning himself or being recaptured and he would probably be killed, the Christian went back to the lake and he rescued the soldier. And later on he wrote this. He said, the love of Christ constrained me to do it. I had no other choice but to be faithful to my Lord. That's how he treated his enemy. George Wishart was a Scottish preacher. You might not have heard his name, but you might have heard the name of John Knox, who you see there on your left. You're right. He was also a Scottish preacher. John Knox on your right was actually one of the leaders in the Protestant Reformation. He also started the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. And so George Wishart, he was a friend of John Knox. He was sent to die as a heretic. But the executioner knew of Wishart's work. He knew that he loved hundreds of people and took care of hundreds of people who had the plague. And the executioner couldn't bring it upon himself to carry out the execution. And George Wishart went over it. And he bent over and he kissed him. And this is what he said. He said, Sir, may this be a token that I forgive you. And that's found in the Fox Book of Martyr. And so that's how this Christian treated his enemies. And so let's look at application on how they got these scriptures wrong. By one, eliminating as yourself and by aiding hate your enemy. And Jesus says, love your enemy. How do we love our enemy? And the first thing I want to show you is a story on how to love your neighbor as yourself in the book of Esther. And I love this story. And I just sometimes wish I can get the veggie tale version out of my head. But I just can't. Because I have five children and I taught children's ministry for 15, 20 years. And that story is the story of Esther. But anyway, here's how the story goes. You know that Esther was King Xerxes' queen. And now Haman was King Xerxes' right hand man. And the others would have to bow down to Haman. And Mordecai was Esther's uncle, but Mordecai would not bow down to Haman because Mordecai worshipped the living God. And so Haman devised a plot to kill all the Jews, and also he devised a plot to put Mordecai and hang him on the gallows. But one night the king could not sleep, so his servants read him his chronicles. It was like his diaries. And when it was being read to him, the king learned that Mordecai saved his life from an assassination attempt. And so he asked his servants, he says, what was done to honor Mordecai? And they said, nothing was done to honor him. At the same time, Haman walked in the door and he was just ready to ask the king if he could hang Mordecai on the gallow because he just got finished building the gallow. And the king interrupted him and stopped him from speaking, didn't hear a word that he said, and he said to this, he said, Haman, what should be done for the man who the king delights to honor? And so it says, Haman thought to himself, and he says, who was there that the king would rather honor than me? And so this is what he said. He answered the king this way. He said, For the man the king delights to honor, have them bring a robe that the king has worn and a horse that the king has ridden, with one with a royal crest placed on its head. And then let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. And then let, the robe, then let them robe the man that the king delights to honor and lead him on a horse through the city, proclaiming before everyone, This is, he, this is what is done for the man that the king delights to honor. And then the king said, that's great. Go at once, get the robe and the horse, and do everything that you have just suggested to Mordecai, the Jew, who sits at the king's gate. And do not neglect to do anything that you have recommended. And see, this is the perfect example of how the honor and respect that Haman wanted for himself. He certainly did not want that for Mordecai, but it turned out to be that way. 
And one of the commands you're going to see, I'll just touch on it real quickly, is that we should be careful when we put curses on other people. Are we wish that something happens to someone else because oftentimes God will allow that very thing to happen to us that we wish on someone else because the gallows that Haman built for Mordecai was the very gallows that Haman was hung on himself and so there's three ways that we can demonstrate our love for our enemies and then we'll, we'll close and this is the first way directly out of scripture that Jesus tells us how we should love our enemies Again, an enemy isn't someone who's trying to kill you or someone that you're at war with. An enemy is just someone that doesn't get along with you, doesn't like you, is hostile towards you, or in some way you just can't get along with this person. And so these are the three ways that Jesus specifically tells us how to love our enemies. And the first one he says is to bless those who curse you. And now the word bless in the Greek is where we get the word eulogy. And the eulogy means to speak praise of someone. So, as a pastor, I had to learn, if I do a funeral, and a person was a completely ungodly person, is a wretched, horrible person, you're not supposed to talk about how wretched and horrible he was. A eulogy means you need to just find something good to say about the person, whether he was a man, or he had clothes, or whatever, if you can't think of anything. He had a mother and a father. You're supposed to think of only good things that you can say. And so, bless those who curse you, what Jesus is saying is don't think of negative things in your head. Only think of p the positive things that you can say about this person. And of course, the things that we teach our kids, if you don't have something good to say, then don't say nothing at all. And so, Paul tells us in Romans, he says, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Doesn't this mean anything to you? Can't you see that this kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? See, God is incredibly kind and patient to us. Sin is throughout the world, and people say, why doesn't God stop sin? Why, doesn't God, why does God allow this? Why does God allow that? Well, what, did, what do you want God to do? Do you want God to stop it? Do you want God to stop sin? If he stops sin, what's the wages of sin? Death. We would all die. But God's patience is made so that we have time to repent. The second way you can bless those that you consider your enemies is do good to those who hate you. And so normally when somebody doesn't like you, you they won't even talk to you. They don't hang around with you. They don't want to have anything to do with you. And so what we need to do is we need to pray that God will give us an opportunity somehow to do good to that person. The neighbor that I spoke of, he was really frustrated because he couldn't turn his sprinkler system off. And so it gave me an opportunity to walk over there because I fortunately had just read the instructions on how to do my sprinkler system. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known either. And so I went over there, and he gave me about 15 seconds of his life to turn his sprinkler system off. He didn't say thank you. He was all frustrated that I was there, but I just helped him anyway. It was an opportunity. And then I just left. And so pray that you have an opportunity. The people that you know that don't like you, they shun you, they're unkind to you, pray that God will give you an opportunity to meet something in their life. And God may very well create a need in their life that only you can meet. And finally, pray for those who use you and persecute you. Because the bottom line, is, Paul tells us in Ephesians, is this, and we need to always consider this. Paul says, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. And see, all men have sin and the guilt of sin rides on all men. And when I say men, I mean mankind, man and woman. And see, guilt produces a fear in a person. And the greatest fear that people have is the fear of death and what lies behind the death, even though they won't tell you that. People will turn to drugs, they'll turn to religion, they'll turn to alcohol, they'll turn to sex, they'll turn and say things like God doesn't exist. And they'll do all other things they can do just to somehow get rid of that guilt that's in their life. Get rid of that fear. But remember, Isaiah said, there is no peace to the wicked, and you can know that for sure. When I witness the people or I have an opportunity to talk to somebody and I know that they're not a Christian, I know instantly that they're lonely, they're sad. They don't know what life is about. They have no love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. They have no place waiting for them in heaven. Their life is very dismal no matter what facade they show me because God's word tells me that they have no peace. 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you may know him, he was a pastor in Nazi, he said this. He said, this is the supreme demand. Through prayer, we go to our enemy. We stand side by side with our enemy, and we plead to God that God will save his soul. And Jesus concludes what he's saying is, why should we love our enemy? And the rest of what he says there on the Sermon on the Mount in regards to these six things, he says, this is why you should love your enemy, in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. And John says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples, and you have love for one another. And it doesn't mean that we're going to be Christians if we, as sons of the Father. Basically what it means is that God's going to say, like Father, like Son. When we love those that are unlovable and we love the enemy, we are being like God, like Father, like Son. And he says, in order that you may be sons of your Father. And he says, because he causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the, on the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So he's basically saying good people get the sun, good people get the rain, bad people get the sun, bad people, everybody gets the sun and the rain, and everybody gets God's love. Everybody is deserving of God's love. And so everybody deserves to have our love also. He says, for if you only love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what more do you do than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? And this was really a slam on the Sadducees and the Pharisees who thought that their love, that their little group was better than others. And Jesus was saying, no, your love is no different than the world's love. Your, no, your love is no different than the love of any sinner. This group stays with this group, and this group stays with this group, and your group stays with your group, and that's the love that you have. And that's not the love that I want you to have. Doing good to people that we dislike and loving people that we dislike is similar to trying to have a bird eat out of your hand. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but it's not a very easy thing to do. But if you're patient long enough, you will eventually succeed in doing it. And so the Apostle John, when he was old, church history tells us that he would often be brought into a church. Sometimes they'd have to carry him into a church. He was the last living apostle, you know, and he was very old, and he couldn't speak very well. And they would put him down in the chair, and they would ask him, just give us some wisdom. Tell us something. You've seen Jesus. I'm, I'm sure of anybody that had seen Jesus at that time, people flocked to him. And this is what John would simply say. He would kind of mumble. He would just say, love each other. You just need to love each other. Don't worry about all the rest of that stuff. If you focus on loving each other, then you got it right. And previously, John wrote this in 1 John 4.10. He said, this is the real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. He said, dear friends, since God has loved us so much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us. And in this love, we brought to full expression. People will see God. They will see God's love when they see God's love in us. And so we need to love our neighbors as yourself. And we need to love your enemies in these three ways. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those that hate you. And then pray for those who despitefully use you. And let's pray. Dear Lord, we just again thank you for your word. We just thank you to hear the heart of Jesus, the words of Jesus. Lord, your kingdom is so much different than our kingdom and our world around us. But Lord, help us to be citizens of your kingdom. Help us not to be like the Sadducees and the Pharisees who try to do all of this in their own strength because we cannot do this thing in our strength. We cannot live the way you're asking us. We cannot obey this command in our own strength. So Lord, I just pray that we would just surrender our lives to you, that you would live through us, that you would speak through us, that you would love through us, And we would just yield to you. We'd walk in your spirit and be obedient to you. And then this week, as you give us these examples of these tests, I'm sure you're going to give each one of us a test this week to bless those who curse us and do good to those. Look for opportunities and pray for those who use us and for our enemies, our personal, our political, religious enemies. Lord, that when we have that test, we will obey you and show you that we do love you and thank you for what you've done for us. So, Lord, I just thank you for this command again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.